Hi, Tom Trento, director of the United West. As we all know, it's been 13 years since Islamic jihadis attacked the United States. Sadly, in these 13 years, there's been some very deleterious developments, one of which is increased anti-Semitism, increased Jew hatred, increased isolation of the nation of Israel, not just by Arab countries, but by European countries and even by many here in the United States. Against that background, the United West and Rabbi John Hausman of Avatora Synagogue in Stoughton, Massachusetts, decided to bring together some of America's leading military law enforcement and intelligence experts to articulate a good understanding, a thorough understanding of the necessity from a national security perspective the necessity of the United States to stand with Israel in an unqualified fashion, particularly against the shaky position this Obama administration holds toward Israel right now. So we went and secured some of the top folks. We got uh, General Jerry Boykin, who uh, was the former head of Delta Force, worked in the Department of Defense after serving admirably as a soldier for 36 years, then went and worked in the CIA. Along on the panel with him was General Tom McInerney, three-star general, distinguished flying career in the Air Force, flew over 400 missions, over 4,000 flight hours, highly decorated, and uh, staff command in many various positions. The third panelist was Station Chief Gary Bernson, CIA. Gary actually was awarded distinguished medals from the CIA that usually are given to people who lose their lives. Well, he was there, live and in color, and you're going to see it in our two-part series. We brought these three panelists together, and our moderator, the absolute perfect person to bring these gentlemen of these different disciplines together to articulate this national security position for Israel was none other than Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, former congressman here in Florida. We want you to take a look at part one and part two. We want you to understand the systemic, the military, the geopolitical, and the moral reasons why the United States must stand with Israel. So now sit back, enjoy, but also be mobilized and be uh, equipped for action as you watch part one of our Israel Security Summit. To my friends at the United West and my friends on the panel, Station Chief Gary Bernson, Lieutenant General Tom McInerney, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, and Colonel Allen West, you have my undying appreciation and love. My friends, the Torah teaches chazak ve'ematz. Be strong and of good courage. There are always reasons to be afraid. And the prevalence of danger can be incapacitating. The same inaction that afflicts a frightened individual can befall a people and can befall a nation. And then optimism is really fear in disguise and indolence is the result of feeling paralyzed by the possibilities of failure. We see intelligence seeking justifications for its fear and finding them readily. For every cowardice has its own philosophy. So wrote Albert Camus in homage to an exile some 60 years ago. Speaking about a man of freedom and a man of courage, Camus declared, those who are like him must come toward him and tell him straight from the heart that he is not alone and that his action is not futile, that there always comes a day when the palaces of oppression crumble, 
when exile comes to an end, and when liberty catches fire. My friends, the world is filled with peril. And it is so today, no less than 73 years ago, at the start of World War II for this country, no less than 75, 78 years ago for the Jewish people, as we were herded about Europe to be tercerated according to the late Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin. Decimated means you lose one-tenth of your people. We lost one-third. To place your head in the sand like an ostrich does not mean that the perils will be diminished. And I will tell you that the timid are not less often hurt. They are just less vividly alive. As Camus wrote in Reflections on the Guillotine, knowing you are going to die is nothing. But knowing whether or not you are going to live, that's terror in anguish. So I end as I began to all of us here this evening to a hall filled to capacity, standing room only. Chazak ve'ematz. It is our job at this time, this nexus in history, to be strong, to have courage, and to act upon that as well. When the concept for this evening began, when it germinated, I made a few phone calls, sent out a couple of emails, and here they are. But who to moderate? Please welcome my dear friend and honorary member of the Jewish people, Alan West. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I, I just noticed something. It's always the same. The generals get to sit, and the colonel has to stand. <laughs> Even in retirement, they still know how to do that. Well, it's truly an honor to be here with each and every one of you. And when the, the rabbi talked about that very important verse, that verse, for me, comes out of Joshua chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, where it says to be strong and of good courage, for the Lord thy God shall never leave you nor forsake you. And if you ever see me out running and you see this little dog tag flipping around while I'm running, you turn on the backside of that dog tag and you see Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. And I cannot think of anyone better to recognize of being strong and of good courage as we talk about the challenges that are facing us in the United States of America and indeed in the Middle East and Israel and all across the world than this person that we're going to present with an award tonight. Chief Joseph Caffarelli. He's the chief of police at Revere, Massachusetts. He's the commander of the special weapons and assault team that captured the second Boston Marathon bomber, Zokar Sarniev. Tonight, we are going to recognize him with the 2014 Citizen Patriot Award. Chief Caffarelli is accepting this year's award on behalf of all of the Thin Blue Line, all of the law enforcement agencies that participated in the apprehension of that heinous individual. Chief Caffarelli, please come forward.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Distinguished guests, Colonel, thank you very much. Uh, I'm humbled and honored to be a, among these guys. And it, as I've spoken to them uh, before speaking, it, it seems like our paths have crossed many times in my military career and theirs. Mine not so distinguished as theirs. I was a very small cog in a very, very big machine. They were at the helm, and I was doing what I was told. Simple as that. The night in question, I, I, have, I feel compelled, and the only way I can accept this, this award in any capacity is on behalf of all of law enforcement. Thank you. By whatever, whatever divine province put us where we were, uh, for, for good or bad, my wife would tell you for bad, but I, I think it would, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else in the world. But. She disagrees. We were, we were where we were due to the, the efforts of thousands of law enforcement f professionals who are unrecognized at this point. They were pulling bomb parts out of buildings. They were scouring land dumps and dumpsters, uh, putting in evidence together. Or they, were, they were reviewing hundreds and hundreds of hours of surveillance footage to put the photographs out that we saw, the now famous photographs of the, the, the Zanaya brothers that are unrecognized uh, virtually. And, and I'm, I'm a guy that, that we were involved in from the beginning. I'm a guy that got a picture in a boat. And it was, it was a pretty neat picture, but I got a picture in a boat. Much like my Marine Corps background, we had Iwo Jima. It's six, it's five, five Marines and a Navy Corps were photographed on that island, but it took 35,000 to take it. And it, it's similar. I got a picture taken in, in the takedown, but it was many, many thousands of law enforcement professionals who put me there. There was many, many more public safety uh, officials from all, all disciplines, fire and EMS, who supported the operation. The people of Watertown, who opened their homes to us, and there's many anecdotal stories that have gone on and on, but to a, to a home, there, were, there was no resistance, there was no, uh, nothing but welcome to, to, to my officers, as we, the, the houses that we searched, they welcomed into our, us into their homes. Many left water. They could see that we were tired. We had been boots on the ground since, since 1230 that morning. They, water, food, coffee, anything that we wanted, fruit, just to, because they could see that, that we were, we were at, at the end of our tether at that point. Um, my personal hero, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop boring you with my little anecdotes, my personal hero from, from the marathon bombing is, is my, my canine officer. Um, I won't say his name because he's very, very reluctant to, uh, to come forward. I, I got to literally take him at gunpoint. <laughs> but when, when, the, when the, bo uh, the, uh, the marathon was bombed, and we all remember the, the footage that was going on, my, my call was to Chief uh, Dan Linsky of the Boston PD. I said, what do you need? He said, I need detectives and I need bomb dogs. I called the detectives, no problem. They rolled out immediately. I called my bomb guy. He's not answering the phone. Uh, now I'm getting mad at him. Where are you? I'm calling the phone. The cell phones went dead. Texts were, were unanswered, and I'm getting uh, pretty frustrated. Well, if you look in that footage from that, the, the first bombing, he's in it. He was running the marathon, as I should have known, because he runs every year. So when he finally got to a phone that worked and called me, and he says, Chief, what do you want? What do you think I want? Where the hell are you and your dog? I just ran the marathon. So I felt about this big at that moment, but... Uh, <laughs> I didn't see him for a week afterwards. He was at Fenway. He was at every major event, the president's visit, and he was, he was in Watertown uh, the night of the capture. I didn't see him for a week. Him and his dog, I think they're going steady at this point. <laughs> That's my hero. And, and on, on behalf of him and all law enforcement, I accept this. Thank you very much. And true to form, if you let a Marine talk, they'll talk for as long as they <laughs> I love those guys, okay? Look, we're here tonight for something very serious. And it is a pleasure and an honor to be back here at Stoughton. It's a pleasure and an honor to be back here at this synagogue with each and every one of you. And the purpose of this National Security Summit, America is at a critical crossroads in our global standing, and this is clearly apparent in the Middle East. We are facing a vile existential threat in the Islamic terrorist army known as ISIS. And the reason why I say ISIS is because if people say ISIL, that means that they are not respecting the existence of the modern day state of Israel because Levant means that there is no Israel. So please do not say ISIL, always say ISIS. Israel is engaged.
Israel is engaged in a new conflagration with Hamas. The Maghreb, North Africa, is falling into the hands of Islamists, and Egypt is confronted with a struggle with an age-old enemy, the Muslim Brotherhood. All of this has come about after President Barack Hussein Obama stated that America's foreign policy would pivot away from the Middle East. This summit will analyze and assess the critical situation developing in the Middle East with Islamic totalitarianism and jihadism and its effect upon America's national security strategy and relations with regional actors of Egypt, namely Israel. What are the impacts for our ally Israel? What are the regional impacts for Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Libya? What are the courses of action for America in the current Middle East turmoil? Does the United States have an effective foreign policy in the Middle East, and what could be better? As well, how has our intelligence apparatus performed in this situation? How can America leverage diplomatic and economic actions against jihadist supporters such as Iran, Qatar, and Turkey? And can our U.S. military meet the requirements of this very volatile and fluid threat environment? and solutions. What are the recommendations for our intelligence community and military strategy in the Middle East? So with that being said, let's get started. Let's get to our panel. William G. Jerry Boykin, Lieutenant General, United States Army, retired. U.S. Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence from 2002 to 2007. A 36-year military career, 13 years in an organization that he was an originating founding member and also commander of Special Operations Detachment Delta, better known as Delta Force. Not Chuck Norris, Jerry Boykin. <laughs> he was involved in numerous high profile missions, including the 1980 Iran hostage rescue attempt, the 1992 hunt for Pablo Escobar in Colombia, and the Black Hawk Down incident in Mogadishu, Somalia. He's an author, a teacher at Hampton Sydney College in Virginia, and currently is the executive vice president at the Family Research Council. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General Retired Jerry Boykin. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. On the weekend of the 12th of June of this year, I was in Jerusalem when three young Jewish boys were kidnapped. I was with 150 members of the Israeli Defense Force at the time. I saw an outrage among them that I had never seen, and I've lived in Israel. I've lived in Akko with the Golani Brigade. But I saw an outrage that I had never seen among them before. And I came home and I said to my wife and my friends, they're going to Gaza. They're going to, they, they're going to find these young boys dead and then they're going to Gaza and there's going to be a bloody conflict and it's not going to be like in the past. And my words proved to be either clairvoyant or prophetic, whichever you choose. Israel has no place to go. And that's what the average American simply does not understand when they talk about proportionality, proportionate responses. Americans do not understand the plight of the average Israeli. This is a very personal thing for me, not only because my children are Jewish, but because when I lived in Israel with the Golani Brigade, the battalion commander there was a guy named Amir Maital. Amir Maital was killed on a raid into South Lebanon. He was shot by a Hezbollah fighter. He was like a brother to me and this became a very personal issue with me. So I've spent my life uh, since Amir was killed trying to understand not just from my personal experience of living in Israel, but trying to understand the plight of the Israelis. I've read books, I've studied, I've talked to people. And what I've come to understand is that Americans are totally ignorant of the history 
of the Jewish people and the history of Israel. They do not understand it, especially the generations that are now becoming the leadership of America. That includes Barack Obama. They do not understand the history of Israel. Do, they do not understand that Israel has a tremendous impact on this nation of America. That the history of Israel and America is a history that is rich. They don't understand that our founding fathers gave great credit to the Jews, to the ancient Jews. They don't understand that if it wasn't for the fact that the three men that said there'll never be a Jewish state all died. Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, and sadly our own president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But they all died in a man who never should have been the vice president of the United States or but especially should have never been the President of the United States, was there at 1600 on the afternoon of the 14th of May, 1948, when they handed him the message recognizing the sovereignty of the new nation of Israel. And with his own pen, he wrote out, he, he crossed out the new Jewish state and wrote State of Israel. Americans do not understand that that was a barren wasteland. That was a barren wasteland until the Jews came and made it a prosperous, thriving place where Muslims came to work for the Jews. And the only reason that these so-called Palestinians are not in that land today is because their own people told them to leave. Because we're going to attack these Jews, we're going to kill them and run them out of here, and then we'll bring you back. The only reason there's a Palestinian plight today is because their own people abused them. I have a great passion for the Palestinians. I go frequently to Israel, and I try to minister to them as well as to the Jews to meet their humanitarian needs. But their own people have abused them. It's time for America to understand the details of what's going on in this part of the world because Israel has no place to go. God bless you. The closing of the Air Force song says, we live in fame or we die in flames. I cannot think of any person better that exemplifies that phrase than Lieutenant General retired Thomas G. McInerney. He's retired from the United States Air Force. He was a command pilot with more than 4,100 flying hours, including 407 combat missions, 243 in 01s as a Ford Air Controller, 164 in F-4 Charlies, Ds and Es during the Vietnam War. In addition to his Vietnam service, General McInerney served overseas in NATO and Pacific Air Forces and also commander of the 11th Air Force in Alaska. He is a former United States Air Force Vice Chief of Staff. Currently, he is a Fox News contributor and is a member of the Iran Policy Committee. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General Retired Thomas McInerney. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you all for being here tonight. This is tough stuff we're talking about, okay? Uh, we have to understand the threat we face. First of all, radical Islam is an ideology as evil as Nazism, fascism, and communism. Now, I don't know where <clears throat> the gulf is between radical Islam and Islam. I learned about Islam well after I retired after 9-11. I made sure in my 35-year career in the Air Force, I focused on communism, the Soviet Union, China, and North Korea. But now I have to go out and talk to groups like you all, be at Fox in 30 minutes. And where I learned was from a former Palestinian 
I'll give you his first name, Walid, and I spent eight hours with him. And when he was 14, his mother convinced him to strap a vest on in Palestine, go into Israel, and blow up and kill 200 innocent Israeli women and children. And after listening to him on that, I said, we are fighting an ideology. And you must understand that. It may not be politically correct, but we must understand the ideology we fight against. And unfortunately, our national military command authorities, <clears throat> the commander in chief, <clears throat> do not understand that. I'll be very clear. If anybody has heard President Obama call the enemy radical Islam, please let me know and show me when he said it. Or when the former or when the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they called them radicals. What does a radical mean? An Irishman? An Italian? You must identify the ideology we fight. And that ideology is in the Koran, the Hadith, the teachings of the Prophet, and Sharia law. Those are their rules of engagement. You must understand that. You could have looked at that film and said, well, <clears throat> I'm not sure many people believe that, but I assure you they all believe it. And that's something that we in the West must understand. Whether it's Hamas, which attacks Israel with thousands of rockets and people want proportionality because there were not enough Israelis killed, or Hezbollah with Gary is an expert on, or ISIS, or Al-Qaeda, CARE, they're all the same. Don't get confused by the alphabet. Know thy enemy. And until you as the average American public start to understand that, and you appreciate more than any, because the Jewish population is the target. They want utter destruction of Israel. And we have not provided the support in the last six plus years to Israel that she deserves. I am very worried about Israel's survival. Three nuclear weapons, three nuclear weapons can ensure the destruction of that country. And if anybody here thinks that the negotiations going on between this administration, the P5 plus one in Iran, <clears throat> that we have not already given them authority covertly that they can develop a nuclear weapon, you're not reading between the lines. We are in a very dire position. If five nuclear weapons go off in the United States, at five of our cities, people are gonna wake up and say, how did we let this happen? That's a nightmare scenario. I don't want any part of it. But as I say, this is tough stuff. If someone flies an airplane into the World Trade Center with 200 plus people on it, it doesn't bother them. Does it bother them to put a nuclear weapon in a US city and kill a million? Not at all. Because he's going to be a Shaheed, a martyr, like Walid was. And his mother convinced him to be a Shaheed, a martyr, and 72 virgins. That's the ideology we fight. We must understand that ideology. And we must put the burden of responsibility back on them. They must pick up this responsibility. And we as a nation and the Western world, Elizabeth uh, from Vienna is here, she'll talk about Europe. The fact is, is Europeans have become more anti-Semitic than even before Hitler. And we need to be aware of that. And we need to be able to speak out against it. Yes, it is hard stuff. And some of the anchors and Fox have said, you're a little harsh, General. Yes, I am harsh. But the consequences 
are so dangerous to our way of life that we have unilaterally disarmed ourselves. I'm going to wrap it up to give you an example. Because not only do we have the Middle East, we've got the Ukraine and Russia. When I was the Vice Commander-in-Chief of U.S. Air Forces in Europe, 1988, the height of the Cold War, I told people earlier, we had 4,000 tanks in West Germany, American tanks, M1A1s. We had five divisions there, and in 10 days we could get five more divisions. These were heavy or arm, mechanized divisions or armored divisions. Today, we have zero tanks in Europe, and we have got zero heavy or mechanized divisions. We have no deterrence. Peace through strength was Ronald Reagan's driving force, and he got that peace through strength. And now we have unilaterally disarmed ourselves under this administration, and no one's aware of it. And so we need your support. We need your thinking about these problems and talking about them. Because Israel is in the most dangerous state that she has ever been in her short history. Thank you very much and God bless you. Our next panel member is sometimes referred to in a very affectionate nickname. And it's because he is willing to go to places that people can't talk about and do things that many people would not be willing to do. That nickname, we affectionately call them, is Spooks. <laughs> Gary Bernstein is a decorated former CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, career officer who served in the Directorate of Operations between October of 1982 and June of 2005. During his time at the CIA, he served as a CIA station chief on three separate occasions and led several of the CIA's most important counterterrorism deployments, including the United States' response to the East Africa Embassy bombings and the 9-11 attacks. He was awarded the Distinguished Intelligence Medal in 2000 and the Intelligence Star in 2004. He ran for the U.S. Senate in 2010 for Chucky Schumer's seat, but lost the Republican primary to Jay Townsend, who in turn lost in the general election. And also another claim to his fame is several of those five senior members of the Taliban that were returned back to the Taliban, he was responsible for their capture. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Bernstein. Thank you very much, Colonel West. Uh, I'd like to say, first off, I am, I am thrilled at the, the turnout here. I am just so impressed with the program that the United West has, that Rabbi Hausman has. And um, it is, it's an important uh, turning point in this country for people to sort of come together to speak about, to recognize the threats that we're facing. In 1979, uh, at the time of the Iranian Revolution, most Americans had never heard of Ayatollah Khomeini. Khomeini and his, his, his theory called Velayat e Fahi, rule of an Islamic jurist, would sort of change the Middle East. And what it would also do is it would take Iran from being an ally to the United States to putting us in a position of Iran being the major confrontation state with America. In addition to taking our hostages, Iran would turn to terror and create a terrorist organization in Lebanon called Hezbollah. During the course of my career, I worked on Iranian operations in the late 80s, early 90s, and then in the late 1990s, I would be the chief of Hezbollah operations in CIA. I got a first-hand look at both the Iranian problem and then the Hezbollah problem. Iran, a country of 80 million people, sees the United States in black and white terms where 
We are their principal enemy in the world and they will do everything possible to drive us from the Middle East. At the same time, Hezbollah, which gets created in Lebanon, is an action arm of the Iranians. So the Iranians, not only did they have an army, a revolutionary guard corps, an intelligence service, a Chodz force, it would create Hezbollah and the Islamic Jihad organization. And the Islamic Jihad organization would be that group that would blow up our embassy, kill the Marines in Beirut, kidnap people, torture people, and do bombings around the world, would participate in the attack on Kobar Towers in Saudi Arabia, would do bombings in Europe, would violate US law, and do attacks on us for over 30 years, and at the same time, attacking Israel. One thing that all of us need to understand about Hezbollah, ladies and gentlemen, here, because the vast majority of us are American citizens, is that Hezbollah hates us, the United States, more than it hates Israel. It's attacking Israel because Israel is on its border. But when you read the speeches of Hassan Nasrallah, its Secretary General, it hates us. We are the great Satan and Israel's the little Satan. And Israel, unfortunately, is in the crosshairs because it is so close. The issue of Iran and its nuclear program. Iran is second in the world in, 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 in oil and second in the world in natural gas. Why does it need a nuclear program? It sure ain't for energy, ladies and gentlemen. The Iranians have been pushing forward on this for a number of years. They're getting close, they're getting very close. In the United States, of course, we have the talks, the P plus one, P5 plus one talks. It is very, very clear that the current administration made a decision, a major decision several years ago. It would break with its history of seeing Saudi Arabia as our primary partner in the Middle East and would start to shift over and attempt to make Iran our new partner. The Saudis and the GCC are horrified and they really, quite frankly, we have lost massive credibility. All the time, the Iranians are negotiating with us and at the same time planning to attack and not afraid to plan to kill American citizens or to kill Israelis. Iran is the major confrontation state for the United States. Unfortunately, this administration believes that we can be friends. About a year ago, I participated in an article, I wrote an article, co-wrote an article with a, a former agency officer, where I talked about the United States should engage Iran for talks on the principle that we would engage them for talks and once it was clear that they were not going to comply with those, that we should attack them and destroy their nuclear facilities. This administration decided, nah, -uh. we're gonna talk and we're gonna give them the program. The United States will continue with the negotiations and ultimately what will happen is the Senate will not be able to, the Senate will never ratify anything, but this administration will cut a deal with Iran and we will have some sort of, of agreement that both presidents agree to, but our, our Senate will never agree to it. And it will probably be, after, hopefully in two years from now, Conservatives will come back to power in the United States and we will be able to move forward from this madness. <laughs> Israel, Israel and America share Hezbollah and Iran as deadly enemies. They are the deadliest of enemies. No one in this room should underestimate the Secretary General of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah. This is a man at 15 years of age, before Hezbollah was created, was the Amal representative for his town. This is a man that studied in southern Iraq in a seminary, which was Bakir al sadr seminary, and he learned the principles of Veliat de Faqi, rule of an Islamic jurist, Khomeini's principles, before Khomeini had even won the revolution in Iran. This is a man that is committed to Iran and loves them and in the past 30 years has probably received $30 billion from them over the years. Hezbollah is a big organization now. They started as a gang of terrorists and now they have the ability to deploy a 15,000 man militia 
to fight in Syria. These are dangerous times, ladies and gentlemen. These are times for serious people that recognize the threats that both Israel and the United States face. And I was just talking about the Shia. We haven't even gotten to Hamas and the other groups. Israel now is facing Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in, in, in the southern Lebanese area, and now it's got al-Nusra Front near the Shaba Farms on that part in the uh, far east where, where the Syrians have pulled back and actually the Filipino army, the, the, the were members of the UN have been, written, have been run off. But the fact is, is the number of enemies around Israel are increasing, they're becoming more lethal, and these are threatening both Israel and American interests in the Middle East and in the world. I look forward tonight to our discussion. Uh, I, I've spent many, many years on these specific issues and look forward to, uh, to the, the questions from the panel and, and from all of you. And thank you for coming. All right, let's begin with our panel. In 24 hours, United States President Barack Obama will deliver a speech on his strategy on ISIS. We have heard what President Obama does not want to do, and there have been intonations of his taking three years to defeat ISIS, or degrade ISIS, or dismantle ISIS, or make it a manageable problem. From your respective areas of expertise, what would you offer as your strategy to deal with ISIS? Start with you, General Boykin. Kill them. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> I'm, listen, I, I, let me say this. I am actually an ordained minister now that I'm out of the army, but there are times when you need to kill them, and, and for you Jews, you remember what Joshua was told when he got ready to cross the Jordan River. He said, kill them all. Now that's what you've got to do with ISIS. You've got to kill them all. Now what would I do? I would put a robust intel program in there that would identify every possible location. I'd do exactly what we have done, put special forces on the ground with all the laser tar target designators so they can designate targets. And then I would put in all the air power, drones and everything else that I can get and I would kill them. Finally, I would take care of the humanitarian needs of all of the Kurds, Christians, and Zahidis. And that's it. As a quick follow-up, General, before we move to General McInerney. So when the President states that he will put no U.S. ground troops on the ground, is that really a viable strategic uh, you know, option that he has? If he wants to achieve the, the desired end state? It's semantics. How many people we have in there right now? I just talked to a guy in the Pentagon yesterday. We got over a thousand people in there right now. Is that boots on the ground? It depends on the semantics of it. Look, we took back the country of Afghanistan, and Gary was talking about this earlier today when we were having dinner. We took back the country of Afghanistan with small 12-man special forces teams augmented with some Air Force people that know how to control air and laser target designators working with the Northern Alliance. That's boots on the ground by any other measure. That's boots on the ground. But do we need large maneuver units? I do not believe we need large maneuver units. We've got what we need. Now let's give them all that they need and arm the Kurds. Thank you. General McInerney. Jerry wasn't kidding when he said kill them. And that's what we've got to do. Let's get serious about this. And they're gonna know if we mean it. In the same campaign that Gary saw in Afghanistan and that uh, Jerry just talked about, is I would do. I can tell you, we know where they are and we can put a bomb through each one of these windows, whether it's in Mosul, and of course you know out between Mosul and uh, uh, Raqqa, the, quote, center of gravity for the uh, ISIS 
is there's probably not a tree between for over 100, 200 kilometers. So if they can't move and resupply their forces in Iraq, they're not going to survive. And I would attack in Syria. And I'd cut a deal with Bashir Assad. If he wants to keep his air defense system, we're only going to go in 150 to 180 miles inside Syria. We're not going to bother your forces, but we're going to take out ISIS. It can be done. And it should be done within 90 days and over. I assure you, this president has the slows. He's got to get moving. If he wants to do it in three years, you know, why would you let them build up for three years? Why would you let them create more wealth, as Gary says? Because this problem is going to metastasize between ISIS, Hezbollah, and Hamas. Let's understand that. Their overall objective is to destroy Israel. And if we timidly go after them, that's what they're going to have time to do. That's why I say and I repeat it. Israel could not be in more danger in its history. And this campaign is an easy campaign. We've already proven it in Afga Afghanistan. We have the air power assets. We have the intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets. Let's do it. Follow-up question, General uh, McInerney. What is your perspective? I mean, you've flown countless combat missions and you know about a dedicated air campaign. Would you classify what we're doing right now as a dedicated strategic operational level air campaign? And furthermore, can we meet the desired end state of defeating, destroying, degrading ISIS just with air power? Well, uh, first of all, we haven't even given it a name. And in our business, if you don't have a name, it's like a football game. If you don't have a name, it doesn't mean you're really serious about it. We have flown 150 sorties in three weeks this Thursday. We ought to be flying a minimum of 200 a day. Do you see the magnitude I'm talking about? So this piecemeal, as we say in the military, or pinpricks, has been effective. The Mosul Dam got rid of them, helped the Azaris. The, it, the, the effects have been good, but they've been too small. And so this president has not indicated a seriousness, and clearly they see that. They shouldn't be able to move a vehicle. They did us a favor when they seized all those vehicles, those tanks, those MRAPs, the Humvees. Now anything moving in that area is an enemy. I spent a year of my first tour in Vietnam as an airborne fact. This is not a hard problem. This is a very easy problem for us. But he's given us handcuffs. The other things is that we've had really throughout this whole 13 years is the rules of engagement have been far too respected restrictive yes. not only in the air and on the ground but on the ground and and that means and you know it so very well Alan that the ROE that you had to live with were ridiculous I came in in the Air Force and all my commanders were World War II the chief of staff was General Kurt LeMay I spent an hour with him after my first tour in 64 in Vietnam he dropped two atomic bombs on the Japanese. The Russians knew he meant business. We are sending a clear signal that we do not mean business. And two days after the Hamas and the Israelis started their exchange, we send them $47 million for humanitarian. Does anybody here think that the humanitarian efforts got that money? No way. So you have an administration that is aiding and abetting the enemy. This is a very dangerous charge. <laughs> air power alone will not do it. But we have air power and ground power right now, Alan. So there's enough there. We may have to beef it up. Air power alone with the Free Syrian Army wouldn't be air power alone. And so we have the right mix today to do it. And if the president comes out tomorrow 
with the three-year campaign plan and all this, you know he is not serious. That's true. And we are putting Israel at risk. Thank you, General. Station Chief Bernson. Um, as just using Afghanistan as an example, in 2001, at the beginning of uh, the Afghan campaign, the Taliban had 70,000 fighters, that was their army, and five to 7,000 members of Al-Qaeda. We used 135 CIA personnel and 350 special forces, and that's all the Americans that were on the ground to defeat that force using US air power. So understand something, uh, uh, what the general just said, we don't need a giant force. We need a force that's on the ground, that's mobile, that's lethal, and, um, and people, now, what we did have is we had each of the six elements, we had six team leads. I had the Shamali Plains and was with General Fahim. And so we had 15,000 members of the Taliban trying to break into the, into the Panjshir Valley. where We had 5,000 defending initially, and we were able to go on the offense because US air power came in. So we had forces to take and hold. We will need to very rapidly assemble partners on the ground that can assemble and hold some areas. And because of the complexity of the situation right now, part of the problem is, is we left Iraq in such a hurry. It was an evacuation from Iraq. And what happened is, is Maliki essentially was a Shia version of Saddam Hussein. And the Sunni, of course, hated him. And many of these Sunni tribesmen that we worked with before have flipped over and worked for ISIS and have switched sides. So we're going to have to have some people that we're going to be able to work with on the ground. The Kurds are not going to go out of Kurdistan. They'll help in Mosul, but they won't go beyond that. They've been primarily a, def primarily a defensive force. So we're going to have to have other partners. One of the things I've mentioned several times, I've been on television last week or two, is the cost. 1991, George Herbert Walker Bush raised yet nine other countries, like within the first two or three weeks, to commit to pay for this campaign. The United States should not be paying for this campaign. Countries like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Kuwait, Qatar need to pay for this. As same with the Iraqis. They've got money. People dubbed, people, people mocked George Herbert Walker Bush and they called it the Tin Cup Tour when he went around. But when that war was over, ladies and gentlemen, we didn't owe a penny. Not a penny. George Herbert Walker Bush was a magician in foreign policy. And yet Jim Baker was fantastic. So we need to make sure that, we're, that we do eliminate them. We also got to get other people to help pay for this, this, this effort. Anyway. Again, three years, the three year timeline demonstrates they're not serious. Well, we've had a lot of talk about Israel, and so let's start looking at the ramifications of our failure in foreign policy and national security and how it affects Israel. We just saw Israel you know, going up against Hamas once again. And unfortunately, we also have Egypt who was fighting against the Muslim Brotherhood, and Egypt came up with a ceasefire plan, and the United States of America rejected that ceasefire plan. For whatever reason, the United States decided to sit down with Qatar, who the head of Hamas lives in Doha, Qatar, and they are big sponsors of Islamic terrorism, being Hamas and even ISIS, and then also Turkey. And we know that President Erdogan of Turkey has really become more of an Islamist and trying to institute Sharia. The question is, can you have a viable ceasefire with an Islamic terrorist organization whose reason for existence is your extinction? Start with you, General McInerney. No. And, and I, I just, whenever you see this action by this administration and this president, let's face it, it is this president that made those decisions, then you've got to understand he is not supporting Israel. It's very simple. It's very clear. And that's why it's such a dangerous situation for us. Hamas will never, ever make peace with Israel. Hezbollah won't. None of them will. And so that's the danger. If you think they will, you live in a different world. Uh, you, you, I'll be harsh. You'd get in line for a shower if you think that. 
That is very harsh language. But they want to destroy Israel. They'll do anything. They'll sacrifice their population. They don't care how many school kids. Anything they can do to destroy Israel is what their objective is. So any administration that even thinks that you can deal with them doesn't understand the problem. Wow, what an amazing presentation. And that's just part one. Be sure to watch part two following this, but you saw a packed house up in Stoughton, Massachusetts. You heard Alan West, uh, Gary Bernson from the CIA, General Jerry Boykin, General Tom McInerney, uh, discuss, analyze, dissect the important elements of a strong, stable national security relationship from a geopolitical perspective, from a military perspective, from a historic perspective, and from a personal perspective with the nation of Israel. This is essential stuff, folks. Watch part two and watch the amazing conclusion we have in store for you.